Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service. And for those joining us on Facebook Live, welcome to our service today. A little bit uh, about middle of the service, after we sing some songs, we're going to have communion today. So we're going to have it in the, before the sermon, which is not typically the case. So watching online, if you would like to take part in communion, go and find something that you can use for bread and for the juice. And we'll do that right after the first three songs this morning. So it's a lot cooler today than yesterday, right? So it's nice to have a little bit of air conditioning outside, but it was nice to have summer as well. So we're glad that you're here to worship with us today. So we'll invite you to stand and let's sing together this morning. Thou changest not thy compassion, 
Okay, you may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Let's go and bow our heads and focus and talk to the, our Father in heaven this morning. Good morning, Heavenly Father. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Lord Jesus. Lord, even in this week, as the scientists have told us about black holes and um, white holes and things that they've just discovered that are too, be, too far beyond us to even understand. But Lord, how much greater, how much more awesome is you? Lord, uh, we are amazed. Lord, we are captivated by your beauty and your majesty and all that you are. Lord, we worship you and only you today. And we thank you, God, that we can have a personal loving relationship with you, not just for this lifetime, but for all of eternity. Lord, as we talk about that a little bit later, Lord, even now captivate our hearts of who you really are. Lord, we worship you and alone, the only true living God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to send our children off to their groups at this time, so you can head off to your groups. Glad that you're here today, and thank you for the leaders that will be leading your groups this morning. We're going to come to the communion table, oftentimes referred to as the Lord's table. And on that very night that Jesus was betrayed, he met with his disciples in the upper room, part of the Passover meal. And he took bread and he broke it and gave thanks. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it new meaning. That the bread is the broken body of Christ and the cup, the Passover cup, is his own shed blood that allows that relationship with Almighty God. I want to quote from Oswell Chambers, and he wrote this many years ago. Since my eyes have looked on Jesus, I've lost sight of all beside. So enchanted my spirit's vision, gazing on the crucified. So as we come to the table this morning, I want us in your mind's eye to gaze upon Jesus. I want you to be enchanted in your inner spirit by gazing at the crucified, the Lord Jesus dying on the cross. Can you picture that in your mind's eye? The suffering, the pain, the anguish. In the hours leading to the cross, he's been beaten and tortured beyond belief now nailed to the cross for nothing that he had done for he was the sinless man of God son of God but he took our sins as our substitute he took all of our punishment all of our shame upon himself so let's go and open this little container with the first little membrane there and to find the wafer. And as I said, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's eat of the bread together today. Father, we thank you for the broken body of Christ. Lord, we are so grateful that you sent your Son, your only Son, to come to this earth to live the sinless life and to die upon the cross. And all of our sins, every single one, were placed upon him. And he endured all of our punishment, all of our shame, all that was intended for us, he took upon himself. 
And God, today we come with grateful hearts. We come with praises upon our lips today. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And then if we take the next layer off of the cup, we come to the juice. There's a number of cups in the Passover meal, and it was that final cup he, he took, and he gave it new meaning. For hundreds and hundreds of years, the Jewish people had taken those cups to remember the Passover, the blood that was shed as the Passover lamb that was put up around the doorpost in Egypt. But Jesus said, now with my own blood, I will be that Passover lamb the Lamb of God, my own blood, so that anyone under the blood of Christ will never experience the second death, but will have that personal relationship with God forever and ever. So let's drink of the cup today and remember the blood of Christ. Father, we know that the scriptures tell us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, there is no forgiveness of sin. Lord, we think back to the very beginning of time with Adam and Eve when they rebelled against you, and so all mankind followed suit. And they hid from you because they, know, they knew that they had sinned and rebelled against you. But Lord, to restore even that temporary relationship. You killed that animal and you placed the animal's skin upon Adam and Eve and blood was shed. Sacrifice system was established through the centuries leading to Christ. But he was the ultimate sacrifice. The scriptures tell us that once and for all, Jesus died for us, never to die again, and three days later, being raised from the dead, never to die again, and that as in his death we have been forgiven, in his resurrection we have been granted a new life, a life that is not just in quantity forever, but in quality, in this abundant life of a new relationship with Almighty God and with other people. So God, we can simply say today, thank you, thank you, thank you for the Lord Jesus and for all that he's done for us. And even at this moment, he is our advocate. He is our intercessor. He is our great high priest. And Lord, one day he comes and we will serve him for all of eternity as King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, we worship the Lord Jesus Christ alone as our Savior, as our Lord, as the director of our lives. Lord, we pray that in this moment that you would receive all of the glory and praise. For as Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. When I am lifted up, when I am exalted, I will lift all men and women and children to myself, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that I am Lord unto the glory of God the Father. And so, Lord, today in our hearts, we once again, we bow our knee, and, Lord, we confess that Jesus is our Lord. May it be so, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My Bible is open this morning to John chapter 6, and I invite you to open your Bible or to take out your phone and to go to the app and to go to John chapter 6 and verse 1. John 6 and verse 1. We come to a, a very familiar story that we're going to use as a, a launching pad for our sermon this morning. In John chapter 6, verse 1, is the famous story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 men. Remember that story? Jesus feeds 5,000 men. Probably also women and children. 
maybe the scholars tell us as many as 10 or 15 or 20,000 people are gathered in that place on that day. Uh, they're on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it's a very remote location. Uh, they've traveled there some distance. And the scriptures tell us that it's in the spring of the year, it's this time of year, where the grass would be very green. It's not most time of the year, but it would be in the spring of the year. And it's basically, picture in your mind, this great amphitheater where thousands of people could gather, maybe sit down on the grass, and there was Jesus teaching them. The scriptures tell us for many hours, Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. And they listened as he taught them. The scriptures also tell us that it was now later in the day, and they had been there all for many hours, and it tells us that Jesus had compassion on them because they had nothing to eat, and they were now hungry. And there were no food trucks that were lined up for food that day. And so Jesus goes, you remember the story, and he says to his disciples, he gives them this test, this quiz. He's like, okay, how are we going to feed? How are you going to feed all of these thousands of people? And they're like, we don't know. And they go and they gather, what, five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus goes and multiplies it, and everybody gets all the food that they want, and there are 12 baskets of food left over, and all the disciples, they get a doggy bag to take home. And it's now evening time, and Jesus, in, in the next section, in verse 16 and following, he tells his disciples, get into the boat, go back across the Sea of Galilee, go back to Capernaum, where they lived, I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to go and pray. And Jesus sends them out into a storm, remember. He sends them into a storm. The thousands, they all stay. They're kind of in a, a, a food coma, right? It's like Thanksgiving Day, and they're maybe just laying down the grass. But they also decide not to get into their own boats to cross the sea because they see the storm that is approaching. But Jesus sends his 12 disciples out into the middle of that storm. Jesus goes off to pray. In the middle of the night, when they're still out there rowing and they're not getting anywhere, Jesus goes and walks on the water, and he goes out to the boat. Remember that? And, and he gets into the boat, and they go off to Capernaum. So the next morning, the sun rises. There's still thousands of people kind of camped out on the east side of the Lake Sea of Galilee. And then they begin to look for Jesus, because some but he had noted that Jesus had not got into the boat with the disciples. So they're like, okay, he has to be around here somewhere, and we're kind of getting hungry. Maybe he'll give us a free breakfast as well. But they couldn't find him. And then there are some boats that come over from the city of Tiberias, which is right across on the west side of the lake. And, and they come over, and everyone's looking for them, and it's like, no, he's not here. And so they get into boats, and they go over to Capernaum, northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. And there's Jesus and his disciples. They find him teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. And he is teaching people. And so can, you, can you imagine there are thousands, maybe not 20,000, but there are thousands of people that all of a sudden, boom, they show up. And they're like, we found him. He's over here. Come on, follow me. He's over here. We found him. And hundreds, if not thousands of people just kind of gather around. And you need to make a mental note. Because this is where Jesus is the most popular. He is a celebrity being followed literally by thousands of people. It's not going to last very long because by the end of this day, the thousands will leave him. But he's the most popular that he'll ever be right at this point. And so thousands of people are gathering around. And this is where we pick up the story in verse 25. It says, when they found him, when they found Jesus on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, teacher, when and how did you get here? So this is the first of five questions that they're going to ask him on that day. How did you get here? Now, Jesus doesn't go and answer their question. He doesn't go and say, okay, I walked on the water, I got on the boat, they gave me a ride. He doesn't share any of that. But he goes and he says this phrase that we've been looking at, and we're back at looking at, at this phrase this week. We took a week off last week. But he says... Amen, amen. 
He says, truth, truth. He says, very truly I say, or verily, verily, depending on the version you're using. He says, amen, amen, truth, truth. What I'm about to tell you is really important. Listen up. And this is what he says, because he knows the motivation of their heart. And what does he say in verse 26? He says, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me. I, I know why you're looking for me. Not because you saw the signs, the miracles I performed, but because you, because you ate the loaves and had your fill. He says, the only reason you're looking for me is because you're hungry again and you want another free lunch. And that's the only reason you're chasing after me. And then he says, okay, now here's the truth. He says, do not work for food, physical food that spoils, but for food that endures or leads to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. He says, okay, here's the truth. He says, stop chasing after all the physical things. He says, go and chase after the things, work for the things that are most important, the things that will lead to eternal life. And the word life here, and please note this, all the way through the book of John and through the Gospels, it is not physical life. It's a totally different word. The Greek word here is zoe. And zoe is not about physical life, though it kind of goes over their head. Zoe is, we would probably best translate it as eternal life. But eternal life, as I've said a number of times over the last year or so, do not filter that in your mind that eternal life equals only everlasting life. It does, but that is not what the word means. The word means to have a personal, loving relationship with Almighty God. That is eternal life. That's the definition that John that Jesus gives us in John chapter 17. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, by experience, not just to know about God, but to know God by experience, and the Lord, and, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So that's the definition of eternal life. So we need to understand that. That's what he's offering to them, not spiritual, uh, not physical life, because they already have physical life. He's offering to them this personal, loving relationship with Almighty God, but it goes psh, right over their head. They don't, they don't get that. They should have, but they don't get it. But make sure you get it today, that you understand that. So then let's, let's continue on. So they say, okay, uh, how do we obtain this food that leads to eternal life? That's their next question. Question number two. In verse 28, it says, he says, so then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? So tell us, tell us, Jesus, what do we need to do? Uh, how do we earn this? How do we work for this bread, this food that will lead to this new type of life? Now that's typical of all mankind, isn't it? It's, it's the, the way of the world that we do something and we get something. So it's like, okay, what do we need to do so that we can get this? But God doesn't work that way because he works on the principle of grace. We can't deserve it. We can't earn it. And so please note, and if you don't have it underlined, verse 29, please do. This is a very important statement or a mark it well. So Jesus answered, Okay, let me answer your question. He says, the work, singular, the work of God is this. The work of God is this. If you want to do something, there's one thing and only one thing to do. And what does he say? This is very, very important. He says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. That, Jesus, that, that's it. You, you just have to believe in me. You have to trust in me. You have to entrust your life to me. That's all you have to do. And that is how you gain eternal life. 
this life of quality, of this personal loving relationship with Almighty God. That's what you have to do. You simply have to believe in me. Now, many people today, and even sometimes Christians, will go and say, you know, it seems that Jesus teaches one thing about salvation, and then the Apostle Paul comes along later in the second half of the New Testament, and he teaches something completely different. But it's not true, because here, Jesus clearly teaches that salvation and to gain eternal life is by grace, and it's not by works, it is by faith, by believing and trusting and trusting your life to Jesus Christ. That's it. So in the same way that Paul would later write to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2 in that famous statement in verses 8 and 9, Paul just amplifies what Jesus is saying here in John chapter 6, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is by belief. It is by trusting. And this is not of yourselves or it's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast before God. Now, I, I remember very clearly a day, a Sunday, very much like today, in a setting very much like this one, in March of 1986. And the pastor of my home church was preaching from Ephesians chapter 2 that morning in verses 8 and 9. And at the end of that service, we sang a very well-known song, Just As I Am. We're going to sing that at the end of this service today. Uh, that's the song that Paul picked out, not even knowing I was going to be speaking on this subject. So it's, it's the Holy Spirit, right? So, uh, so we're singing that song, and the pastor had said, anybody that uh, would like to come forward... And in those days, people were invited to come forward, and I'm going to do that this morning, so keep that in the back of your mind. And if you'd like to come forward and you have questions about what I've talked about today, and, or you, you really, you've come to that realization that it's not by works and it's by grace, then come forward. So we're standing up, we're singing that song, I'll never forget it. My dad is standing to my left, my mother is standing to my right, and she goes and she pulls on my shirt, and she says, I want to go forward. And I said, okay, let's go. <laughs> and boy, both of us came right down the center aisle, and we stood right in front of the church. And the pastor said to me, he said, okay, Scott, take your, take your mom, go out back, answer any questions that she might have. And so, boom, we went out there. And I'm like, mom, why did you come forward today? And she said, really for the first time, I've understood that it's not about works. It's about God's grace, and it's just about believing. And so that's what Jesus teaches. What do you need to do to gain eternal life? Believe in the one in which God the Father has sent. Simple as that. Now here, here's the takeaway. Jesus has done for us what we can't do ourselves. We're spiritually bankrupt. We can't, we can't go and repay God for all of the sin and rebellion that we have in our lives. Whether it's small or great, it doesn't matter. We still, we're just spiritually bankrupt. We, we, we cannot do it. So Jesus has done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. When he died on the cross, he paid our penalty. He became our substitute. He paid our great spiritual debt. He paid it off. But then, of course, he did even better than that. He went and he gave us a new life, a new start, a new beginning, as we saw a few weeks ago in John chapter 3. He says you need to be born again. You need to have this new, fresh start. You need to start over because you're in spiritual bankruptcy, but I'll take you out of the bankruptcy. I will pay for all of your debt, but I will give you a whole new way of life. Kind of reminds me of my probably my favorite TV show these days. It's on the Food Network, uh, Thursdays at 8 o'clock, I think it's called, uh, Restaurant Impossible. Have you ever seen that? And there's a restaurant that's usually run by a person or a couple or a family, and they owe hundreds, usually hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they're trying to run their restaurant, and it's not going really well, and Robert Irvine shows up and says, okay, uh, I can save your business. 
I can rescue your business, uh, we can go and, and pay off your debt, but you're going to have to go, cause the, you're gonna have to change the way you're living, the way you are doing business, because your menu is not up to snuff, uh, your, your decorations and your tables and chairs, and I'm gonna come in, and I'm gonna replace all of that, and you're gonna have a fresh start. And that's what Jesus does. He pays off all of our spiritual debt, but he gives to us a whole brand new life, a whole new start, and that is eternal life, that whole new start. So question number three, we come to verse 30. So they say, okay, um, what miracle will you do so that we will believe? Uh, we will believe in you, we'll trust in you, we'll entrust our lives to you on the condition that we can come up with some kind of bargain. Isn't that incredible? But don't we do that oftentimes with God? Maybe we've done that. You can think back to a time and say, okay, God, uh, let's come up with a bargain. If you will do this for me, you know, if, if you will heal me or if you will heal my relative, or if you will give me a new job, or you'll allow me to keep a job, or you'll help, help somebody, then I will follow you. If you prove to me that you can go and do something great. And this is what they're doing. But it's incredible what they say here in the next verse. Their demand. They say, okay, um, what sign will you give that we see and believe? What will you do? They're right, okay, here it goes. Our ancestors ate the manna, the bread, in the wilderness. And, he sa and, and, and they say, and he, Moses, gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they said, okay, Jesus, you fed us yesterday. That was great. But now we want you to be like Moses. And basically what they're saying, and, and I'm going to put it into uh, modern terminology, but what we want from you, Jesus, is a filet of fish sandwich for lunch for every day, six days a week for the next 40 years. And if you will do that like Moses did for our ancestors, we will believe in you. Now that's incredible because they had just seen this tremendous miracle the day before. Five, 10, 15, 20,000 people being fed with all this food left over, but they're like, no, we want more. And if you do more for us, then we will believe. Uh, that's, that's, just, that's just incredible. But in verse 32, let's focus on verse 32. Again, Jesus says, amen, amen, truth, truth. And he says, God, my Father, not Moses, gave the Israelites bread in the wilderness. So, he says, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who, was given, who has given you bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you now the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life, not this, uh, physical life, but the spiritual life to the whole world. He says, so Jesus says, okay, I need to correct you. It was not Moses who provided the manna it was God. And now my Father God, he is giving to you the opportunity to take this new bread, me, the source of eternal life, and you are to take me, absorb me, accept me, and I will give to you this new life. So in verse 34, they say, okay, always give us this bread. Okay, you got a deal. We will accept it. Always give us this bread. And then in verse 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And again, not this bread of physical life, but of Zoe, of this personal loving relationship with God. I am the source of that. I am the source of eternal life, this personal loving relationship with God. Now, this is an important metaphor, because when he says, I am the bread, he's not literally saying, okay, I'm bread, right? We know that. It's a metaphor. I am the source 
that you need to come to to gain this eternal life. Verse 36, this is kind of shocking what he says. Jesus says, but I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. I mean, they, they have seen his miracles, they've heard his teachings, but they won't believe. And they won't believe. Most of them say, no thanks. And by the end of the story, they all, most of them walk away. And so Jesus knows that's going to happen, so let's continue to see what he says. He says, all those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. I will never cast, cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone, everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. He says, now that is, that's the truth. All the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive out. Now who recognized Jesus as the source of eternal life. It tells us here, and this is a, a little bit of hard teaching, is the ones that the Father had come to them. The, one, the ones that the Father gave to, to his Son to have this eternal life. And so the Father draws people, not all people, but some people. And then Jesus says, for those that come to me, I will Never drive them away. Because what Jesus begins, he will complete. Now, one of the lies that I sometimes believe as a preacher, and I do, I believe lies sometimes, a, a lie that if I simply share with people information about how to gain eternal life, as I'm doing at this very moment in this very place, that everyone who hears my voice, whether in this room or in this building or listening online, that they will all immediately respond and say, oh yes, I believe. But is that how it works? No. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. The problem is not lack of knowledge. The problem is the issue of unbelief. Because people just refuse to believe. Now, why is that? In Ephesians chapter 2, we'll put it on the screen, verse 1. It says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. In a dead person, it's pretty difficult for them to do anything, right? And this is my own personal story. I was spiritually dead in my sins. But God the Father opened my eyes so I could recognize who Jesus really is. And so God was the one that opened my eyes. That was in June of 1972, almost 50 years ago. And Jesus understood that some would understand this bread, metaf this bread um, metaphor, and they would recognize that he was the source of eternal life. But he also realized that some would just get stuck on the physical bread. It's like, I just want physical bread. I'm hungry. I just want a physical lunch. And they would never come to accept this far greater gift. Let's come down to verse 41. The people began to grumble. Uh, it's more than just grumbling they, um, they were now disputing among themselves. Verse 41, at this, the Jews there began to grumble. They had this big argument going among themselves about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, and they asked their next question, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? They're like, we know who he is. 
We know Joseph and we know Mary. This is a small community of Jewish people. We know his family. We know him. We've known him maybe for his whole life. And how can he now say that I've come down from heaven? And so they're in this big argument and they just simply don't understand. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary? Verse 44, Jesus goes and he says this in verse 44. Let's go back to verse 43. Stop grumbling among yourselves. Jesus answered, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise them up at the last day. And in verse 44, he quotes from Isaiah 54, verse 13. He says, all your children will be taught by the Lord and great will be their peace. And so Jesus is saying here, let me teach you. Please listen to what I'm saying. But they would not listen to him. So he says in verse 45, it is written in the prophets, they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me, no one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. And now in verse 47, he again he says, Amen, amen. Truth, truth. He says, listen to that. This is very important. He says, very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. I am the source of eternal life. So Jesus, he can't make it any more clear. He says, I am what you're looking for. I am the source of this new, tremendous life. I'm it. And then they have a, another question. How can this man give up his flesh to eat? So let's go back and see what Jesus said. He says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. It was physical food. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which everyone, anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And they're like, okay, what is he talking about? This doesn't make any sense. He, he, he's, he's just saying foolish talk. And they're like, what on earth is he talking about? It just did not compute. And in verse 53, Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, truth, truth, very truly I tell you. Now listen to this. He says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, abides in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. Now let's go back to verse 53, because this is probably the most bizarre statement that Jesus ever makes. And very few people have really ever figured this out. They didn't. They're like, this absolutely makes no sense. How on earth can we eat his flesh, and how can we drink his blood? This is just so bizarre. This makes no sense. And even many, even to this day, they say uh, that uh, this is where they get the concept of the Eucharist from. That the communion table that we had a few moments ago, that literally the bread becomes the body of Christ and the juice becomes the blood of Christ. But that is not what, what Jesus is talking about here. Because what we can easily overlook, going back to verse 53, he says, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in him. Uh, in the Greek language, it is in the aorist tense. It is not something that's repeated over and over every month. It's a one-time event that has lasting consequences. So what is Jesus saying here? It is. It's a bizarre statement. What, what is he saying here? 
But he says there's a, a one-time event. And what he's saying, he says, unless you believe that in my broken body, in my shed blood, you will have no life in me. And so he says, you need to so wholeheartedly take what I've done and who I am into, my, into your life, that I, in a sense, take over your life. As that uh, illustration I used a few moments ago, that we're spiritually bankrupt, that Jesus comes and takes over our life. He gives us that new beginning. He gives us that fresh start. And we need to, in a sense, take every aspect of him into our lives, and he gives to us that new life. And so I think that is what Jesus is talking about here. But there are three promises. He says, if you go and do that, if you wholeheartedly bring and accept me into your life, he says here, I will give to you eternal life. He says, I have the authority to give to you eternal life. He says, I have the authority in this Amen, amen statements. He says, I have the authority that one day to raise you up from the dead and to give you a new resurrected body. And then he says, I also have the authority if you remain in me, if you abide in me, he says, I'm never going to cast you out. I'm never going to drive you away. And he says, we will have this close personal relationship forever. He says, Abide in me, and I will abide in you forever. And in verse 58, he says, This is the bread that came down from heaven. Feed on this bread and live forever. Again, as I said, this bread is, Jesus is not literally bread, but he says, this is the source that you need to come to. And if you eat of this source, if you take this source in, If you consume this source, you will live forever, and you will have eternal life. Now, this is a a difficult teaching, because the end result is that most, the vast majority of people walked away shaking their head. Like, this is too difficult. This is too challenging. Now, three points of application, and then we will be done. The first point of application is this. Jesus did not teach universal salvation, as many people are teaching today. What that means, universal salvation, I wrote to you earlier this week about this, that universal salvation is that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for all people, which is true. But then all people are just automatically saved. They just automatically go to heaven. They are automatically just given eternal life. But as you read through this passage today, it's simply not true. That's not the truth. Because Jesus said, there is a condition. You must believe. You must place your faith in me. Now, Jesus died for all this whole crowd here. But the vast majority of the crowd did not believe in him. They just walked away. They're like, nope, he's not going to give us a free lunch. We just don't want any part of him. So a person must make a personal decision to believe and to trust Jesus for their salvation. It's a personal decision. Each person needs to make it. It's not a group decision. It is not a decision that, well, it's like, well, my mother made that decision, or my grandmother made that decision, or my great-grandmother made that decision. You need to make that personal decision. Jesus says, you must believe in the one that my Father has sent. Number two, not everyone will become a Christian. Not everyone will become a Christian. It's not just a matter of information, but it is of belief and trust in Jesus. And I think the phrase I like best these days is to entrust our lives, to entrust your life to Jesus. It's not just to say, oh yeah, I believe there's a God. Or, yeah, I believe that Jesus was a historical person, or even that Jesus died on the cross. That's, that's not this belief that we're talking about. It's to entrust your life to Jesus. It's like, I believe that you are the only way, 
that my spiritual bankruptcy can be taken care of, that I can have this new life, I can have this new start, that I can experience this personal loving relationship with Almighty God forever. You're the only way of that. And I'm going to entrust my life. I'm going to turn everything over to you, and you're going to be the boss and director of my life. And then thirdly, Jesus is the only one who can satisfy the deepest desires and longings of your heart, of your soul. Because as we look around today, and as it was the case 2,000 years ago, nothing really has changed at all. We look around, and, and, and maybe you're even in that place today, that you're just looking for satisfaction from the physical. It's like, okay, if I can just experience a wonderful meal at a restaurant, it's like, okay, I, I'm just going to be satisfied at my deepest level and right, you only have to experience that once, and it's like, it might be a great meal, but it's like, yeah, there's something still down in my soul that's lacking. Or it's like, well, okay, if I could just go on this perfect vacation, if I could just experience, I'm going to be totally satisfied, and my life is just going to be happy, and it's going to be wonderful, and we realize that doesn't work. Or we gain all of this stuff, and it's like, if I have all of this physical stuff, if I have a new house and a new boat, a new everything, then I'm going to be satisfied. And what happens? It doesn't work that way. Jesus said, the only way that you will ever be satisfied at the deepest levels of your life and to meet the deepest longings and the deepest desires is to have this new life that he offers of this relationship, this personal loving relationship with God. And without that, you will never, ever, there will always just be this hole in your heart that you can't fill. It's like something will always be missing. And only Jesus can fill that spot in your life. And so the physical, whether it's food or materials or stuff, will never, ever be enough. Jesus and Jesus alone is the only one who can meet all of your desires and longings that is in the deepest part of who you are. Only Jesus can do that. And he says, that's what I'm offering to you. I am this bread. I am the source. That's what you, of everything you've been looking for. I'm it. And there is no one else and nothing else that will ever satisfy. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. And we're going to sing Just As I Am and, and a modern version of that, but it'll be very familiar to you for those that have heard it before. And if you never have, then that's fine. And if it's helpful as it was to my mother those many years ago, and you say, well, I still have a lot of questions, or, or I, I, finally, I, I think I finally get this figured out, and I want to go and publicly say today, yes, I believe that Jesus is the one that's going to take, can take care of my spiritual debt and can give me this new life and can give me, uh, can meet my deepest longings and satisfactions. That's, Jesus is exactly what I've been looking for. That song, as we're going to sing, is like, just come as you are. Just say, yep, I'm spiritually bankrupt. I, I, I need help. I, I need Jesus to go and to direct my life. I need this new beginning. I want to start it right now. I want to start it right in this place. And I want to experience eternal life, this loving personal relationship with God from this day forward. I would invite you to come right to this place. In doing it, it will not do anything special for you, but you can come and say, God, I want to do this today. So I'm going to stand down front. If anybody would like to come and do that, let's stand as we sing this song to close today.
Father, I pray that if there be even one here in this room or those, one that might be watching online, listening online today, as they've heard the message, as they've sung this song, or that they have realized that they are desperate, that they need you. They need forgiveness. They need a fresh start. They need a new beginning. They need a new life. Only that you can supply. Only that you can give. So, Lord, I pray right where they are that they just cry out to you in the silence of this room, in the silence of their heart and mind, and to acknowledge that, yes, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. And I believe that Jesus is that Savior. He is the one and only one that can rescue me, forgive me all of my sins, and to give me that new life in Christ and to choose that Jesus will be the new director the new boss the president of my company of my life to go into start completely over that Jesus will give to me all that I need for this new life including the Holy Spirit to give me that strength and power to live differently than I've lived in the past and to have that personal loving relationship with Almighty God forever, to have peace with God and to have the peace of God and to have the love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control that I've never had before that only Jesus can offer to us today. God, I pray that there be anyone here, maybe a number of people, it's like, yes, I want that. I finally understand. Yes, Jesus, be my Savior. Be the boss of my life. Give me, grant to me eternal life today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Let's see, a couple of announcements uh, for you. Uh, let's see, where are my announcements? So thank you for those that took part in the work day yesterday. A lot was accomplished around the church building, so thank you for 
doing that for the Lord. Uh, today we are going to have our second focus group, and it is for anyone that's 18 to 35 years old. And uh, we're going to meet downstairs for an hour, maybe an hour and 10 minutes, and there are 10 questions that I've prepared, and um, we're looking for your input and your um, thoughts and uh, discussion today as we think about what is the best ways to reach out to the younger generation. And uh, that's been kind of our focal point for the last uh, five or six years, but we just want to kind of fine-tune that and to work on that and we're looking for your input today. So we'll be meeting downstairs in a, uh, about 11.15 uh, this morning. So those are the uh, announcements I want to make today. So we're going to say farewell to our friends on Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us today, for those on YouTube, and we just pray that you'd have a wonderful, wonderful week. If you need anything, you have any prayer requests, reach out, and uh, we can pray for you and pass on your prayer requests this week.